Live from San Diego, California, it's theCUBE. Covering KubeCon and CloudNativeCon. Brought to you by Red Hat, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation and its ecosystem partners. Welcome back. Uh, this is theCUBE's coverage of KubeCon, CloudNativeCon 2019, and a special segment. We're actually going to be doing our 2020 predictions. I am Stu Miniman. Joining me, my two co-hosts of the week, to my left is Justin Warren, who I believe's been to, uh, you, you went to the first uh, all, one, I've been all, all, all four, four of the yep. North America shows. Yep. Uh, I personally have been now to uh, three of the North American, as well as one of the Barcelona, and we have a first time Cube Connor, but long time uh, host of the Cube and things. Uh, John Troyer to my right, uh, gentlemen. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, so first thing, you know, the rapid fire. Uh, Twelve thousand in attendance uh, last year. Eight thousand the year before. Four thousand. So my math says that it will be sixteen thousand when we come next year uh, to beautiful November in Boston, Massachusetts, which I can drive to. Uh, we've had snow in Austin, rain in San Diego, so I'm predicting you know, 60 to 70 degree weather in Boston, because that <laughs> never happens in Boston. Uh, number of attendees uh, next year, Justin? Well, it's, it was doubling and now they've dropped it to 50%, so I reckon another 50%, I reckon 18 to 20,000. John? Yeah, I'll go, I'll go higher, that many plus one. Oh, oh so. okay, I feel like we'll do uh, the, the, you know, I bet one dollar, one dollar, yeah, yeah. um, <laughs> but okay. We, we have not hit peak Kubernetes yet. We, no. we definitely have not hit peak Kubernetes. Um, one of the things, uh, I keep looking for the theme of the show, and one of the things we've been talking in some of the segments is, uh, this needs to be, there needs to be simplification. When we talk about where we are with cloud adoption, when we talk about some of these environments, uh, there is a broad ecosystem. So there needs to be some winnowing down of the technologies. Uh, we've seen so, some areas where things like micro -Kates and K3S to be able to put Kubernetes at the edge. Uh, it's not that that will replace Kubernetes, but uh, you know, things need to uh, get, get simpler in so, some environments. Um, Justin, yeah. I'll, I'll throw it to you first. Is, is simplification the theme of the show? Is there something else that's grabbing you? Oh, the, the theme for me is that the money has arrived. Uh, we saw a little bit of that last year, but this year it is definitely just the number of sponsors that we have here, the number of startups that we have here, the, the ecosystem, the number of parties, the VCs are here. This feels like a lot of other technology shows that we've been to before at that, at, in their heyday. We are right here in, in the heyday of Kubernetes. So I can see it getting bigger. Will there be consolidation? Yes, I think there will. Uh, but I think that this is going to broaden out further first. I don't think that we're quite at the point where things need to start collapsing in. I think we're still going to be exploring all the different options that we have. I think this, the theme of simplification, yes, I agree, but it's now going to be people trying to solve that problem by creating these higher level services, managed Kubernetes offerings, uh, a lot of the different com component projects that are there. We're going to see a lot of options where they try to manage that for you and make it easier to consume, but there will be several different attempts at that and not all of them are going to survive. Mm. Yeah, I'll go with you. There is, it, simplification is going to be an issue. Uh, has, has, has to happen. We saw a lot of different stacks here at the show. If you go out on the show floor, a lot of people are trying to give you a generic platform, a general purpose platform. Maybe it has its own opinionated view of networking or storage or management or security. But uh, you know, at, at, the, at the end of the day, we, we need things on top of the platform. So I'm hoping next year we see more things on top of the platform, more applications. We saw some big data applications this year. But um, you know, I, people are still building engines and I want them to build cars because uh, not everybody can build the engine. Yes. Well, and actually, Justin, a question for you is, when we talk about Kubernetes, you know, there's some inter people I interview here and they're like, well, no, we know how to build it better than us and we, when you want to go across all environments, uh, we should do it. Uh, you know, is that, are we still going to see that for a while or you know, can we all hold hands and talk about open source and uh, be able to just manage across all of these environments? Well, one of the, the key founding principles of Kubernetes is that you can operate it the same everywhere. If it's certified Kubernetes, it should function the same no matter whose, whose build of it it is. So that just provides us a common platform that we then build on top of. So I think the main differentiation is going to be on things like the, the tooling and the services that allow you to operate that base layer of Kubernetes. But that base layer of Kubernetes is about as interesting as Ethernet. It's extremely pluggable and it's just ubiquitous, but no one really cares which brand of Ethernet you, you happen to be giving me. I care about all the stuff that I run on it. 
And that's what I think we're going to see a lot more. I'm with, I'm with you, John. We're going to see a lot more of those services. I've see, I'm seeing a bunch of startups at this show that are starting on that journey. They're providing a lot of things like database services, uh, very highly tuned monitoring and, and measurement telemetry systems. There's a big push to make sure that there is a certain amount of interoperability between these different services, things like having open telemetry be the standard for sending telemetry information around, because everyone knows that if we all build to Ethernet, we're all going to have a much better time of it than if we all start trying to come up with our own version of it and call, you know, Banyan Vines and FidoNet and Okay, I'm what. glad you brought up the example of Ethernet. First of all, you know, I have no problem watching a 45 minute uh, you know, d discussion of what 400 gig is going to look like and the challenge and the opportunities and if you are talking Ethernet in someone's data center, for the most part, they're going to run that on a single vendor because while there is interoperability, it's not until I go to the internet because you know layer two, I want to keep it single vendor. When I go layer three, I want to do that. Is that uh, you know maybe it's not the best analogy, but uh, you know no, Kubernetes. I think, I think that's yeah. reasonable. In that, if you're trying to operate something across different environments, then it's much easier if the, the two environments can talk to each other. A simple example that people tend to forget about is M um, and A. If one company goes and buys another one, and I run Banyan Vines and you run, I don't know, Finland or something, then we can't talk to each other. And integrating those two companies becomes impossible. But at least if we both have, you know, you might have Juniper, I might have Cisco, those two network sets can still talk to each other. So as long as you might be running, I don't know, Mesosphere and someone else might be running Mirantis or Rancher, and that's their system for operating Kubernetes, Turns out, actually, if you can operate it much the same, one of you can decide, you know what, we're going to operate everything with Rancher, because we think that that's going to be the best thing for the holistic company. You may keep them separate. As yeah. long as you get the same outcome, then it doesn't really matter. Yeah, that's, I, that's why I think we aren't, get, we do, we aren't yet at, at uh, peak Kubernetes. Those Kubernetes skills that uh, are in high demand from a job market, that people are being upskilled on, they're actually still going to be useful. Yep. Now these stacks, that these opinions that people are doing, um, I mean there was also talk about people, people over projects, right? That's a great philosophy, this is a very friendly community, it's very open source, but I, cynically, I think in sometimes people swap your company t-shirt for your project T-shirt, that your company is the is the one that's be behind, yeah. the, and and that's kind of a that's a little bit of a bait and switch. If if yes, it's an open source stack. Yes, all the major vendors have open source, 100% open source stacks, uh, you know, around Kubernetes, uh, but they're all with different projects, and they're all pick their own projects. So I think that has yet to be resolved. Well, it, it's yeah. interesting because. Uh, it, it, the, the thing that I heard is it used to be open source was something that people contribute to it. Now, the majority of people that contribute to open source do it as part of their job. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, there is some of that, uh, you know, yes, I'm paid by, you know, company, uh, you know, X, uh, but, you know, my job is to participate in the community. Uh, you know, there, there's a large company that got bought by $34 billion. They have a lot of contributors out there. Their job is open source. They are on those projects. They might switch from one project to another. Uh, we had Kelsey Hightower on today. He's like, hey, you know, right, you know, we need to think of people above project. It's okay for them to move from one to the other between projects or between companies. Um, but, uh, right, there, there are, it is very much often companies uh, that are uh, behind the scenes and pushing uh, people and dollars into these projects. Uh, one thing I like about uh, the CNCF here is we do have, uh, it's, uh, there's 129 end user companies participating here, so we've reached a certain maturity level uh, that they are driving it, not just you know, companies driving it for the dollars. So I guess the thing I want to ask though is there's so many companies here, uh, we started off the conversation this week, John, talking about Docker, uh, and you know the cautionary tale of how many companies. When I asked, "What is your business model? What do you do?" is you know I, I created some cool new uh, project. Um, you know what, what what does that mean? You know you look at the business model. Uh, you know you live you know uh, right right with Silicon Valley there. Uh, what, what what are you seeing as you look forward? Uh, what are you expecting to see? Oh sure, I mean half the logos will be gone, and they'll but they'll be swapped out for other logos. So that's all fine, right? I, they, you know. They, if you have a point solution, as I was kind of uh, pointing out, you know things are kind of stackifying. So things are, are need to consolidate from a buyer's perspective. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the sessions here were about custom projects that people people did either in house or for a customer. You know, so I think um, you know yeah, that's okay. That's a, that's the natural. It's a it's the natural Cambrian explosion and then die off. 
Yep, creative destruction. That's that's <laughs> that's the general point of how, how we do things. There's a lot of uh, things that are basically a feature and you can't really build a company behind a feature. Uh, they're hoping that they will find some sort of pathway to money. We've you know, seen some, some big acquisitions where they didn't really find a good route to money. Um, that's fine, people will, will figure that out. And how you fund this development, Stu, I mean, that's the perennial problem. At the moment, it's possibly not the perfect solution, but it's a pretty good one in that we have Developers are employed by a company that pays them to develop open source software. So we can't, anyone can go and grab that software and then use it. So we don't actually really depend on that company sticking around. And enterprise sales is still very expensive to have yep. even a small booth here and three or four people and nice t-shirts and all your swag and you flew them here and, that, and, and fly them all around the country to company after company, you know, conference room after conference room. That is an expensive model to sell things. And yep. you, know, you need to have a fair amount of revenue. All right, so Justin, a lot of progress, a lot of projects. Yeah. What's missing? You know, what, you know, look out for 2020, you know, is there an area or a space that needs to mature or needs work? Uh, you know, what, what, what's your advice for, for this ecosystem? Oh, well for me, it's, it's all about the data. So the, we've seen a lot of evolution in, in stateful sets and being able to manage state-based data within the Kubernetes ecosystem. A lot of progress on that, but there's still a long, long, long way to go. Um, also just on the, the general operational tooling. So the things that we are used to and have taken for granted in, in other traditional, like vSphere, or you know, we've come from the, the VMware ecosystem, uh, simple things like high availability. So I need my data to always be available and I need to be able to have this managed. There's a lot of stuff in there, but there's still a lot more stuff that needs to, needs to happen. Service mesh and that service discovery and making that easy enough for normal mortal humans to deal with, that still really isn't there. You kind of have to be a bit of a super genius to, to configure that and get it working and, and operating. So there's still a lot of very hard work on these quite hard problems to then make it look simple. Yeah, uh, so John, the, the one I want to throw to you is, uh, Dan Kahn came out of the, the keynote stage yesterday and he said, Kubernetes has crossed the chasm, yet most enterprises are still worried about software failure. Um, we know many people that are coming in new and shell-shocked um, when they come to look. What does the, the industry as a whole and this ecosystem specifically need to do to make sure that we don't come a year from now and say, wow, things slowed down because we kind of you know, couldn't you know, get the vast majority of people on board? Mm. Well, I mean, we're going back, to, I guess, then to the same thing. Things have to be simpler. Uh, in times of uncertainty, people either stop or they go to a trusted provider. Uh, there is probably, although there's a high value on, on Kubernetes skills right now, that also means there's not enough folks. Yeah. So if you can't get the engineers, uh, that was a problem in previous generations of some of these stacks, in that if you, if, if you couldn't get enough engineers, or if the stack, if everybody had their own Snowflake version of it, and the skills were not transferable, you could not move forward. Yeah. So I'm hoping we'll see more managed service providers, I'm hoping we'll see more uh, uh, startups and services built on top of these existing infrastructures. Yep. I think we're seeing more of those. I see a lot of stuff in the operations space and kind of the SRE space, the incident management space, the kind of all the tooling you'll need to actually run these things in you know, day two and beyond. And, uh, you know, so, and then hopefully the, the, you know, the industry keeps pounding on digital transformation and process transformation, one project at a time. You start with one, you start small, you start tooling, you, know, you start tooling up, you get some small things under your belt and start to learn. Uh, you know, but that's an enterprise timeline, so that, that is at a certain speed. All right, yeah. uh, last thing, uh, you know, any aha moment surprises, cool things as you've been uh, going around the show, Justin? I would just walking into the show surprised me, just how big it has gotten and how much energy there is here. It's, it's amazing to me, and I, I can just on, only see it getting bigger and, and I hope better. Uh, I am, I am surprised by the reaction from people who haven't uh, come into the Kubernetes eco ecosystem, I think. Um, there's still a lot of people out there for whom this is a big surprise. That it's as big a show as this is, there are lots and lots of people out there who, who can't actually spell Kubernetes. So there's a lot of work for us to go and do to figure out how we get those people to come into this ecosystem in a way that doesn't shock them and scare them away. Yeah, absolutely. Welcome to the party, those that have been joined. Uh, John. Hey, the thing that, that surprised me was this is both a multi-cloud show and a non-cloud show. This is the only show where people working in multiple public clouds can come together. So that's one of the systemic forces causing it to grow. On the other hand, this is not a public cloud only show. 
over and over again. We talk to people here on theCUBE, I talk to people on the show floor, and most of their workloads, or many of their workloads, are on premises. Yes. Right, they, this Kubernetes is fully functional and fully up to speed in private cloud, you know, in people's data centers, because it is useful. And they're starting to do that process tooling and process re-engineering even, even on site. And then they may be using a portfolio of different clouds. So I think that was, that was one of the surprising things to me is it's, this, is, you know, this was not a 100% public cloud show. Yeah, um, and a little bit of caution I'll give there is we want to make sure we don't become complacent and say, oh, well, we could just kind of you know, slide in what we were doing before and not make some change because the driver here we've been talking about for decades now is really kind of that application modernization. Um, and Kubernetes and this whole, it is about cloud native. It's not the Kubernetes, yeah. it's the cloud native piece. You know what I didn't hear? Yeah. Uh, I did not hear uh, Kubernetes, putting uh, legacy apps on, on Kubernetes as much this year. Much yes. quieter this year. Yeah, um, yep. so, and I'll, I'll just say, uh, so I'll, I'll highlight, uh, we did an interview yesterday with the American Red Cross. Tech for good, it's something that we've been highlighting, John Furrier especially, helping you know, lead the charge and, and make sure and we highlight that. Uh, the Microsoft show, they very much talked about that th this year. Uh, American Red Cross is saying, hey, we, we, know you, we know you want, we always want your dollars, but uh, we'd also love your skill set. So this community, and specifically Kubernetes, the cloud native ecosystem makes it easier. There's common tooling, uh, something that I've been hearing a lot this year is when I go through that modernization, I can hire the next generation workforce. There's too many of those, oh, I'm doing the old way. If I don't have somebody with 30 or 40 years experience in the industry, you won't understand our systems. And we, we need that next generation of workforce uh, to, to be able to get involved. So love, you know, future jobs, uh, tech for good, uh, all good things. This community's always been strong on diversity and inclusion. Um, and so, uh, you know, I guess final word I'll say, you know, big shout out to, of course, the CNCF. Uh, this event, uh, they have, you know, a large menagerie uh, that they need to, uh, to t take in here and manage, um, and they're doing a good job. There's always things to work on. They are listening and open. Um, we really appreciate the partnership. A huge shout out, thank, shout out, of course, to our sponsors that make it possible for us to do this. So, for Justin Warren, for John Troyer, I'm Stu Miniman. Thanks so much. Uh, we definitely are excited for one more day tomorrow as well as next year in uh, 2020, Amsterdam and Boston. Uh, please reach out always if you have any questions and uh, thank you so much for watching theCUBE.